Hi, everyone. Welcome to Facebook Live with uh, Holly Bouchard and Joanne uh, Soipi. Uh, we're going to get started here pretty soon. So we're going to have um, Joanne take it away. All right. So uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in tonight. Um, so Holly, we had some questions for you. Uh, the first one would be, can you talk about how you became a professional dog trainer or dog handler, should I say? Trainer I handler. Sure, I sure can. A million years ago, I was a police officer. Mm. And while I was a police officer, my chief said to me once that he hated canine units, but he liked me more than he hated them. And if I wanted to, I could handle a dog. And that's how I became a canine handler. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah, the dog I handled, I, I handled two dogs. Um, one was on the street, the other uh, washed out during testing. And all I handled was narcotics dogs, but what an experience that was. That was just an amazing thing. And I had no idea then that that was going to end up ultimately shaping my life, but it ended up doing just that. How long did you do that for? Uh, just a few years with the Brainerd Police Department. Oh, fun. Okay. <laughs> nice. Uh um, so uh, when did you become a, a judge and, and you know, what, what are some of the things that you really like about judging teams and judging nose work? Well, I was at a trial and one of the competitors said to me that she was a host and that there were always uh, not enough judges to go around and would I consider applying? So I did. And I've been doing it now. Nancy, I judged for you for my very first assignment. So yeah. I think it's been two and a half or three years now. Mm -hmm. oh, it's and I would say three years, yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I love it. I mean, I just absolutely love it. The things I love the most are getting to spend time with the competitors, getting to travel. And most of all, I get to watch the best handlers, the best dogs do the best work in the best places. I haven't ever been able to learn so much as I do when I'm holding a clipboard. In other areas, your attention is divided. Even if you're teaching, you're thinking about what am I going to say next? What am I going to do next? And when you're judging, it is completely your job to just be present in the moment and go step by step with each team. There really isn't a better vantage point to watch the teams work. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that I get the opportunity to do that. Hi, everyone. Um, okay. Um, go ahead, Joanne. Next question. Okay. Uh, so uh, next question. What are um, some of the trends that you're seeing in nose work? Uh, positive things and maybe not so positive things. <laughs> you know, we are such an evolving sport. We're changing from year to year. If you're doing the same thing you were doing two years ago, you haven't been paying attention. So the change is just, the change is just incredible. Some of the trends I'm seeing are, I'm seeing almost a split. And I don't know how to word that better, but there are handlers that are going back into law enforcement type handling. And then there are handlers that are experimenting with the extremes of what a free dog can do. And so I think uh, as far as trends go, I think the two camps are diverging more than they used to, where I think the blend was smoother earlier in the sport, if that makes sense. Hmm. Well, it does. Um, we're seeing, I know in my area, we're seeing a lot of uh, more towards the um, detection type handling. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so a lot more control. And then we're also seeing folks that are um, a little bit more free. Uh, and I think there's the balance is somewhere in the middle. Uh, but um, in your opinion, are you seeing one more than the other uh, as far as, because um, it is evolving and changing. And sometimes I see trends that are a little worrisome and I see trends that are just, you know, well, I think with the inclusion of new venues getting more active besides just NACSW, I think the trend is to see a little bit more handler involvement in the searches. Perhaps that's coming because the search areas tend to be a little bit smaller and that strategy tends to pay off. Where in NACSW, oftentimes the fastest dog is the freest dog because the dog can get itself where it needs to go the quickest. So I, in terms of trends, the biggest trend I'm seeing is a leaning towards the extremes rather than a merging to the middle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that. 
yeah. There's, there's, I think people are trying to, they're trying to find the, the magic bullet um, in nose work. And unfortunately- <laughs> I'm trying that too, by the way. <laughs> Well, and uh, and this is what I'm wondering in in your um because I know in the detection world it's a little it's different right you have very drivey dogs that really want to work and um so some of the techniques that are are in that detection world are real they work because the dogs are pretty drivey but for our mm -hmm. dogs that you know they sleep on the couch and they have a pretty cushy life it's a little different uh different and so well, yeah I hunt behind whippets. And if you hunt behind whippets, you adjust your game plan. Because if I put them on a on a choke chain and a four foot leash, they just probably aren't going to give me their best work. So I had to modify really, really early on because my whippets wanted no part of being told what to do. <laughs> well, yeah, and Hector, could you elaborate on that? What I know you've done. I, I've seen you work your whippet and your uh, pit mix, and now you have a golden. I just got a golden. Yes. Yeah, the, the golden just blows me away at how quickly she picks on to things that took years to teach the whippets. It's really, it's really been an education. <laughs> well, yeah, it's so interesting because when you go from different breeds and whippets, uh, I've had, I had beagles before these dogs. Sure. Um, so it's a little more challenging to train, you know, um, the beagle or and or the whippet, uh, then you have a dog that's like, sure, I'll do it. It's so different. I'll do it a hundred times. However you want me to do it, I'll do it. <laughs> right. So Holly, I did just want to go back to something that you mentioned about how if you had your whippets on a four foot leash, right, and you were leading them around, it wouldn't go so well for you. Since you have had the, the law enforcement experience, is it more about making sure the dog covers all the space or is there more about they have to search a certain way um, for things to be viable in court? Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, in terms of coverage with a detection dog, there's so many different things to consider, one of them being just safety. And you couldn't take your, your lab by the side of the interstate and say, seek dope and hope he didn't squish himself on the roadway. You had to say it's this car and this is how we're gonna cover it and this is what we're gonna do, which is really different than stepping into a safe spot with a whippet saying, go find the things. And so the two are very, very different. I don't know how much of it was about testimony and how much of it was about good habits, how much was coverage and how much was just sheer safety but certainly the handling from detection and the handling to sport in my world have been completely unrelated. Mm -hmm. I, handle, I handle dramatically differently and I make no attempt to return to my roots. My, my dogs can search quicker without me than they can with me telling them what to do. Mm. And that's interesting because a lot of people that we've met that have come from the detection world still are very, very, uh, wanting to control that search because it's like you said very old your habits are what they are and then you tend to just want to um, you know it's what you know and what you learn first and you like like animals we kind of go back to what we learned first you know be, and then you know then go, embrace some of the new stuff so I tend to be really curious and a couple of years ago I had the really good fortune of spending some time with Sue Sternberg who at the time was really experimenting in fairly extreme handling, which is all yield to the dog. Mm -hmm. And I don't wanna use the wrong words, but it was essentially maybe almost an affront <laughs> to my understanding of detection work. And because she was so successful and so good and so compelling, I started paying more attention and more attention. And the more I understood, the more I liked it. And so perhaps I'm on some weird pendulum swing going from the right to the left, but I'm definitely way more on the side of let's see what's possible when we set these dogs free. Mm -hmm. And some of that could just be exploring her work and being very curious about what she's doing just because it was so novel to how I understood the sport to be. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think like one of the, one of the things that I find to, for me in nose work, cause I, is it's a combination you you want it's a really is a, the relationship and the team with your dog right you want to have right. the, you you want to give them the skills to be able to do the work and then you want to be able to 
be that teammate that can get them where they give them the assistance they need when they need it. So, um, yeah, because I am, I, that's one thing that it's, I think, I think the control comes in when they want to become, it's about the ribbons, not about the, the sport. I don't know. And I could be wrong about that. And not that there's anything wrong with wanting ribbons because that's why we do it, but it's mm -hmm. easier to maybe try to control things. And I've seen it as a CEO and as a trainer, it's a, in, a very interesting um, situation with the, with with the with the right methodologies, right? And I don't think there's a right answer. And as we were talking earlier, it'd be interesting to see uh, how it evolves because it's going to change. Like what we what what it is today is going to be completely different because um, it's been ten years since it's been here in the Midwest, and it's completely different than what it was, right? Mm -hmm. Ron was setting heights. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry I missed that because oh the reverence with which he has spoken, <laughs> I never had the fortune of meeting him. Well, here's, here's, I'll give you an example for a level one exterior hide. The hide was in the corn stalk. Oh man. Well, Josh Robbie and I were at that trial and that's where the hide was. <laughs> oh fun. In a very good open field. So a little different. Yeah, uh, these days, uh, but they were fun nonetheless, and they kind of introduced us to a, a quite a different world. Yeah, Ron is uh, was quite an interesting gentleman. So the other, um, and I know we t we touched upon it, like uh, the handling, how you've seen it evolve, because you've been involved for almost since the beginning in the Midwest, haven't you? Close, yes. Yeah, yeah it's been because it's been here since 2010 in our area. Um, so you're there shortly, and then you started judging and coaching and all that stuff. Um, so what would you say, so I, I know you mentioned about handling, what would you say is some of the better things that you've seen or more innovative ways of handling dogs? Oh, I think people are, I think most nose work handlers do this because of the profound love and respect they have for what the dog is able to do. And that's the best thing I see is people experimenting with what's possible with that and people putting the dog ahead of everything else. When you go across sports, I don't think there's another sport where the competitors worship their dogs to the same degree that we do with nose work. We have photographers there, we have videographers there. Everything that goes right, we got credit the dog and everything that goes wrong, we blame ourselves. I think that's one of the coolest trends in the sport is just to watch how people are celebrating their partnership and their friendships, I think above the placements and above the ribbons. Yeah, yeah. that's true. What's the difference between AKC and NACSW in, 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 in regards to, I mean, the searches and challenges are different, mm -hmm. but you say is the biggest um from a searching or trial perspective that you see because you're a judge for both of those venues so i am i'm interested to know like what you find the more biggest differences in the two venues because people say there is no difference but i we we, we i'm a trial akc trial host and and the CEO, and it, there is a little bit of a difference in that in how things are set up and all that stuff. I, I think the difference is actually fairly profound, and that doesn't necessarily mean one is better than the other. They're just <laughs> profoundly different. In AKC, one of the things that I love about AKC is it kicked the doors open to get more dogs and more teams in the sport and playing this game that we love so much. So in terms of just bringing in new blood, new people, new dogs, AKC really gave us an open door for that to get more people interested. The other thing that can be nice for AKC is the handler can be imperfect on a day and still win searches. The pressure to be perfect across the day doesn't exist. And when a team encounters failure in AKC, I think it's a little psychologically easier to shake off the error and go embrace the next search. Where in NACSW, you're a little bit sunk and now it's harder to get yourself up for the next work. So those are things I really like about AKC. The things that I think AKC um, is different on that I'm not as fond of is I think a lot of the strength of AKC odor, I think the dogs can do less prep 
and still be at trial and be trial ready for AKC. But then when they go into NACSW, when the hides are a little more obscure and the search areas are uh, uh, possibly 10 times the size, I think the teams are surprised that they're underprepared for the complexity and the vastness of some of the search areas and some of the pristine conditions. And I also think the pressure of an NACSW trial when you have to be perfect feels a lot higher if you're coming in from AKC where you were allowed to, to win what you win and just lose pieces of your day instead of your whole day. Very different. I think they feel very different. I also think for AKC, the competitors can sit and watch each other and they can be more involved in the day, more social with their dogs on the day. And so then the feeling of NACSW where we preserve the pristine search conditions and we try and make the, the day equal for everyone. So someone doesn't have no one watching and the next competitor has 50 people watching feels very, very different there. The two have extremely different flavors, but I love both for different reasons. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. And we've, um, we've also incorporated a couple other venues with UKC and CPE to get people started in the sport. And I think they all have different, uh, different things that are appealing and maybe not so appealing, but it's, it's either way, it's a great time to be with your dog and, and kind of see how your dogs are doing and enjoy the day and, and different and presents different challenges and gets you out there doing, uh, doing a little more with your dogs. So I, I agree with that a hundred percent. They're not, they're different. It's just, they're not, like you said, not better or worse, just, just different. And, and, and there's really no need to compare them in terms of quality. The difference is compare them as to which is a better fit for which team at which point in their career. There's no need to put them in a hierarchy. There's just a need to understand how they're the same and how they're different and how we can make the best choice for our team. Right. Because some dogs, are much, are much, they're happier. Uh, with a shorter day, and as you, the dogs get a little older, older, uh, you know, you might decide to go to another venue because maybe some of the other venues might become a little bit more difficult or more uh, complex for the dog. So, or you, or you can title out, and if you've titled out, now you've got. If you want a door to open, I mean, an AKC detective search is a really interesting search for a dog that's in its elite has finished its elite championship. Mm -hmm. A lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and also, I forgot about somebody mentioned about P PSD. Um, PSD is not very big here in the Midwest, but um, it's pretty big in East Coast, I think, and uh, uh, South a little bit. That's another venue that um, uh, where they're uh, that's booming too in the different different uh, parts of the world, or you know, in parts of the U.S. Um, so interesting. Yeah, I just was I was just curious about that because people was like, AK, you know, they they start to consider, oh, this is better than the other. It's not. It's just different. And, just and, different. Yep. Yeah, and it and you want to and and it, and with all the different venues do it does allow people to ha choose and be able to be where their dog's going to be happiest and do the do the most for their you know with their dog. So well, and and it allows all of us to play more. And yeah. I mean, getting to play more is always a plus. Yeah. Um, so somebody asked a question, do you have to work through AKC in, in order or can you jump to detective if your dog is an elite? Uh, um, you can, you have to work through at least one element in order, but if you get a master's title in any element other than HD, you can play detective in detective league. So if you, if you, for instance, got all of your container titles, your novice, your advanced, to your excellence, your masters, and the only title you have is a container masters, you then can be in detective. So you don't have to have all of them to get there, but you do have to achieve a master's title in one of the odor elements in order to be eligible to play detective. Hmm. Uh, jo Joanne's also an AKC judge. So do you have anything to add for that on that? Um. The only thing I would say about AKC or even UKC is um, <clears throat> I found it particularly beneficial since I have two young dogs um, to, to keep them in novice and to just bring them up uh, doing that a bunch of times just to give them the trial experience. Um, and so I could sort of work out the kinks on the one search, one hide, one search, 
before I, I went to um, like NACSW, which is the all or nothing kind of day. So I find that really beneficial for that venue as well. I don't know if you feel the same with your new dog. You might be doing that. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, what are some of the and 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 again, and this is not to be um, <laughs> not to be You're negative. You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is, uh, what are some of the of all the, of some of the different handling errors we we make as handlers? that we might make because we're nervous or we just don't realize what we're doing. What is some of, what is maybe one or two things that you see folks really having struggling with um, in, in a day? Uh, is it, um, you know, there's, I, I, we all make mistakes and it depends on the day that that mistake will be what it is, but what do you see to be the most common uh, error, whether it be AKC or NACSW, that you see folks make, um, again, out of maybe nerves, stress, um, or other, you know, issues that are happening. Like you, you had mentioned about going from OKC to a much larger space, but what other type of um, things that we want to maybe be more conscious of when we're out there uh, tri working or, you know, trialing our dogs? If I was limited to saying two, the two I would say are, Handlers in trial under pressure get very reluctant to call alert and they ask for confirmation, reconfirmation, reaffirmation. And by the time they finally, but by the time it's time to finally say the big word, the dog wanders off because they've given up hope. So in terms of errors, the failure to call alert the same way you would not in trial, but in practice is probably the most common error that I see that is painful to watch. Go ahead, swing for the fences, call a false. Falses are beautiful. Just call the false, but don't don't go out not calling. Trust your dog. You came there to trial with this partner. If this partner tells you it's there, take the deep breath. The money's already spent. Call it. So I would say that's the most common one I see is a reluctance to call alert on the same criteria that you would in practice when you get to trial. The other one I tend to see is handlers get stuck and they're clearing, they're moving through a search area, they get curious about something and there is a tendency to go almost paralytic. You freeze up in one area and you end your coverage and handlers can spend an inordinate amount of time standing in one small space that's already been searched rather than moving through the space. They might think that their dog showed interest but isn't alerting and rather than covering the rest of the search area to see if we can get the dog to encounter odor, they stand there and wonder if that was an alert and they waste their clock standing in one spot rather than getting some good coverage. And if they could just step out, it's highly likely that the dog would have a strong reaction to odor and bail them out of the search. Those are the two errors when I see them, especially with newer handlers that seem to be the most common. What do you two think? Um, yes, I would agree with, um, with people not calling alert or not sure or leaving when the dog was trying to tell them hey this is it um and yeah either they call it they don't call, I, it's mostly that they don't they don't want to call it they don't want to take a chance like you said to call it and and i think the other is they're they're not in they're not in the moment and they're not in the, they're worried about something else and they don't they 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 you know i've seen people leave whole search areas, areas uh, not unsearched because they were just so focused, like you said, an inordinate amount of time in one area. So I would agree. Um, those are the two things I see a lot of. How about you, Joan? Yeah, I would say, um, I think particularly with lower levels, but even more some at the higher levels, um, the dog's doing every which way from Sunday to tell you that there's odor there. And they're like, yeah, but he didn't do a, B, or C, right? And it's sort of, if you really ask, number one, does he does he sit, if that's what it is, every single time in training, what are all the things that you as a handler need to watch for that don't involve the last thing in the chain? You know, uh, I, I think there's that. And especially, have you, have you had your dog anywhere but your class or your house to see what they do in a novel environment? You know, um, 
but but yeah, it's it's the same thing that you were saying, really, Holly, is uh, the, the dog's on it, the dog's on it, but the reluctance to call because I didn't see something uber specific. Right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Jennifer Waters wanted you to ask you about writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer's already asked me that. <laughs> I figured I got that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Catherine asks, how do you cope with trial nerves? Um, so I guess, Holly, you personally, since you are a competitor as well, how do you cope with trial nerves? I don't, they, I don't really get them anymore. I, I get a little excited, but it's mostly excitement. I, I don't feel like my team or myself is up for judgment. I don't feel like if we have a bad day that we stink. I don't feel like it's a reflection on me as a person. I don't feel like it's a reflection on my dog. I don't even think it's a reflection on our team as we exist with each other. It's just who found the most stuff today the fastest. And so for me, it doesn't feel deeply personal. That's really protective for me. Um, I know that not everyone feels that way, that the adrenaline, even though we intellectually know all those things, the mm -hmm. adrenaline can take over and make it feel more like a fight or flight, live or die kind of thing and we get invested. And so when I'm preparing teams, particularly for say an NW3, but for all trials, um, I like my teams, if they can, to get out an index card and write down three performance goals that have absolutely nothing to do with getting a ribbon or passing a search mm -hmm. that they can evaluate their day on when they're done and to evaluate those objectives before they go in and reevaluate those objectives as they walk out. And we'll decide that we're gonna judge whether the day was a success or a failure based on some performance objectives rather than outcome. Because let's face it, not all outcome is within our grasp. We can't control all the things that happen during a day. And so it's better to try and evaluate ourselves based on something like that than it is to do that with where we fall in the ranking. Right, and it, and it goes back to, I always tell our students, like my students, do you have a goal for each search mm -hmm. that like, com like you said, completely unrelated to the, it's a, it's a process or something that you wanna try, you wanna work more on leash handling or you wanna work and you wanna give a, it's got, gotta be unrelated to the, the outcome, always the process. And I find that that seems to help people kind of focus on that instead of focusing on the whole day and it, and it helps with the with the stress of the trial nerves uh, so we work on that quite a lot in class for sure um joanne do you have anything to add to that um well and sorry for the the shameless plug there but i know what has helped me um is i did go through the the mental management program that nancy teaches um back with my very first leash list she used to she was a killer searcher, but she used to give me anxiety because she was so fast and she was, I always worried about, am I going to fall or get the leash tangled or any of those things, right? So it it just gave me a little bit of nerves at the line, not on the performance, but just on if I would inhibit her. And uh, that really helped me um, kind of develop some tools to keep myself calm. So, um. So sort of on that, I just had a random other question. So Holly, I know you teach as well. I think this is a really neat topic because it hit me for a very small period of time. Did you ever feel like because you teach, you had to be better? I did briefly and then I got over that very quickly, but, but I just, just curious on your, on your thoughts and both of you on that. So, well, for me, I compete with whippets and I, I maybe I'm going to feel more of that when I start running a golden. But for me, it was so easy because of my dogs to just be evaluating what we could do together that I, I don't think I felt that I'll have students come in and they'll do work. And I just look at them and go, you're going to beat me in six months. I can't touch that. And I'm really, really thrilled about that. And I really mean it. I, I love watching a great dog. And there are just some dogs and some teams that just start from a different place that are just going to have a different experience. And they need to be judged or critiqued based on their own potential. And I need to be judged and critiqued based on mine. And that isn't going to match for everyone. 
I don't think very many of us get into this sport trying to win tins. I, I don't think that's the driving force behind us. What we all want to be is the best that we could be and, the, and a little bit better than we were before. I haven't really felt the need to try and beat my students. And in fact, it's a really, really proud day when I don't. Right. I would have to. I would have to agree with that. I, um, I, I believe that being a competitor and being a coach, uh, you are two. You possess two different uh, um, skill sets for that, um, and they don't. They don't mix. So at, when I'm a competitor, I'm a competitor. I am there for my students, but I don't really worry about. I'm a competitor at that point. The skill set for uh, being a competitor and being a coach are two completely different things. Mm -hmm. so, and like, like Molly put it, I, my, I'm much happier when my students do really, really, really well than when I, 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 I want to go out there and have a good time with my dog and I want to have fun with them. But that's really my, my goal. I don't, I don't want to beat anyone. I don't want to, I just want to have a good time and enjoy my, my guys and, um, and be in the moment. Um, when I started training, trialing with Cha Cha, I, I, I don't even remember her first NW1 trial because I was so nervous. And I said, I never want to do that again. I want to always be remember every trial we've done, everything we've worked together, and enjoy and really enjoy every moment. So after that one, I've I've made that a, a um, my mantra. I just want to enjoy the that moment and that time with my dog. Whatever happens, if we do great or not or whatever. Um, I, I wear a bracelet that has the name of all of my past dogs engraved on it, mm -hmm. and when I step on the step on the start line, I have a bracelet with their names around my wrist. And I remember how short this time is. And mm -hmm. I try and carry that with me when I compete because it all goes too fast. And it's really not about the trend. Yeah, yeah. About, that's absolutely, not to just turn 12 today. So. Oh, happy birthday. So, happy birthday. So I get, I totally get that. She, uh, I can't even believe it. So we, we enjoy every, every moment. And like I said, I, my energy, you know, energy goes into what you, and I, my energy goes into be, trying to be the best coach I can be and the best instructor I can be and the, and help my students achieve whatever goals they have, whatever that, whatever they may be, no matter how big or how small. And that's, and, and for me, like when I go to the line with my dog, I just want to have a good time. And, um, and it's hard because, you know, there are people who really, they want to do well and, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it's, you really want them to also enjoy that, the whole process of being with them. And cause you're right, it's very short and you know, the, and look at all the, with the drama that's going on in our lives now, it's like life is pretty fleeting. So it just kind of helps you appreciate stuff. That's why I wanted to um, kind of have this conversation about uh, the ins and outs and everything about trialing and the fun. And eventually that we'll get back to <laughs> whenever oh, we get. Don't you miss it? Just terrible. I can't stand it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I miss, I miss everyone so bad and I miss I the drama <laughs> and I miss the dogs. I miss all of it. I know me too. It's really hard. I'm like, Oh, Fluffy says Thank goodness for technology that can keep us together at least oh, this absolutely. way. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So speaking of getting back to it, um, Dave had a question. He said he's currently training at NW3 Elite level in NACSW. And if he wants to add AKC as another venue, is there anything he should do differently in terms of his mindset or his training or skills? I had a glip in my ability to hear that, so I apologize. Oh, um, he's training at NW3 and Elite in mm -hmm. NACSW. Yes. If he wants to add AKC as another venue, any um, anything he should do for mindset or training? Yeah, I think so. I think that one of the biggest things to do is to play with the odor strength, because I think dogs that are accustomed to training on NACSW odor can sometimes um, have some transition time that's needed to switch to AKC odor. So I would definitely, I would definitely play with that. And the other thing I would definitely play around with is searching in smaller space and see if some of the tightness of the space is an issue. Uh, those would be the two things that would occur to me the most, practice in smaller space and practice with stronger odor and make sure those are things that are comfortable for your team because I think those are the loudest differences when you go to an AKC trial. 
Also, sometimes as you go up the rung of AKC, the distractors become a little more intense. AKC is more into training through distraction. So I would up that training as well. Although by the time you're at NW3, you've probably worked through a bunch of that prepping for NW2. What do you think? Um, I would agree. I would agree that that the smaller spaces and um, I haven't seen. I mean, I don't know. I wanted. I know. I, I know. I talked to Joanne about it, but um, I don't see the dogs having that many that much difference or challenges with um, the scent, the volume of scent. I, people haven't I have, that I've seen. The dogs really aren't having so much trouble with that. I, I don't. Have you seen that be different? I've seen it be different, perhaps in containers. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen much difference anywhere else. But in containers, I think I've seen an increase of hitting adjacent containers. Mm -hmm. And so it'd be worth dusting it off for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that would be the only, because I haven't seen too much. A lot of the, the dogs haven't had too much, too many problems with, uh, with that. Um, there was a question. Ronnie had a question. Do you feel you're a better competitor because you're, um, because you're a judge? I feel like judging is like cheating. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> I feel like the education I get holding a clipboard, I feel like I should be like paying for that or something because I think it really is a significant leg up. No no doubt about it. And I don't think it's about the fact that I've got the clipboard in my hand. I think it's about being present, just fully present with so many teams as they run and getting to learn from their work. Yeah, I, I think it is easier because I judge. I also think that trial nerves are a lot easier to manage when you judge. I get a lot more anxious judging than I do competing because I feel like I can impact too many people's days. I think I work through most of my anxiety when I judge just because I feel like I would really be letting people down if I screwed that all up. Hmm. Yeah, I, I would. I would. Uh... I would agree with that because it's, it's like, got to be worse when you're a CO. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah, no, it is. It is because you want everybody to pass. That is your right. goal. Everybody right. needs to pass, and and when they don't, it's a little. It's very yeah. You, it's very very stressful, um, and the 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 stress that goes into uh, doing that, um, and it's it just and it's. I don't think it gives me a leg up in the competition necessarily, but it just. Um, it it just makes me think a little differently, which is why I I do CO. I am a CO. It just helps me think a little different or look at nose work from a different perspective, which is um, why I um I, I why I do it. Um, I would uh, I would also say, and Holly, since you do both, right, uh, NACSW and AKC and CPE. And, uh, yeah, NCB. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's the NACSW key, though, right? You didn't set the hide. Right. So right. I, I think being that judge, it really takes a lot of, um, I, I would say, ethics to, to say this is not going well, but this is where you need to hit the hide, right? Have you ever, um, have you ever had that experience where maybe a hide didn't do what you thought it was going to do, and you're like, oh, goodness, but you have to make the call as to, as to how it should go? That's always, picking the range for the height is always so complicated mm -hmm. because the thing is, is no matter what decision you make, you're penalizing someone. If you decide to go wide, you're penalizing the team that sources. If you decide to call narrow, you're penalizing the team that took a shot at it. And sometimes you don't know how that thing's going to run until the dogs start running it. And then midday, the whole thing can go sideways and turn and go another way or go dead. And yeah, that can be that can be really hard. At one of my last trials, we had a really nice hide that read, ran really well with dog and white, ran really well for the first 10 dogs, and then it died. It went away and it disappeared and there's nothing you can do. And the heartbreak of standing there, there's nothing I can do about it but I know that pain of which you speak because <laughs> it isn't that anyone was doing anything wrong. It wasn't that there was a competency shift. It was That's just wrong. the hide changed. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a question. Do you see a trend in hide complexity more or difficult or less? I would have said I saw a trend, 
except for I think it, it's a trend, but it's not an absolute trend. It seems like there was some leaning towards complexity, but then you'll get these pockets or these trials where everything feels like the olden days where it seems to be very spotty. I understand that there's going to be a trend, but I haven't seen it be consistent yet. How about you? Well, NACSW has attempted to uh, give us more uh, information on trying to be more consistent, but because the environments are so varied and so different, mm -hmm. um, you you really, I don't think it's harder, it's just we're trying to be as consistent as possible and be as fair as possible for all. Right. And and um, and like you said, it's like if you you're you're going to set one hide, some of the people who are good at the dogs that are good at, the, at one that have a certain skill is going to be great. And the other dogs are going to be penalized. So that's why it's so important to have a nice, well-rounded training program so that you can handle anything. But I don't I haven't seen a lot of. Um, say, more difficult or harder, I think we're all learning kind of as we go too with the, um, you know, AKC folks are gonna set different hides versus um, the NACSW uh, folks. So it's, it's a little just different um, on, on how how those are set up and the challenges they present and and how thoughtful that judge is presenting the, you know, giving the challenges for the day, right? right. Um, and not stacking them so, so high, so. Well, um, and then, oh, go ahead. The overall trend is going to be towards complexity only because we're learning what's possible. Mm -hmm. When we started this 10 years ago, we didn't understand to the full degree what dogs could do. And as we, as the sport lives longer, it's going to get more complicated. Look at agility. I mean, as we learn what dogs are capable of doing and as we learn what impact handling and training can have, the challenge was we'll have to just continue to be upped as the skill set grows. And the skill sets are growing exponentially. Mm -hmm. um, so, asked about what trend, specific level. No, it's not any specific specific trend. It's basically um, how um, how they're trying to keep things as uniform and as fair and set up as as a, a fair setup for all. Uh, and that just tends to depending on the people's background and what they're what their uh, experiences and what their, you know, what, what they've done, what, how they work, it changes for as a CO what you're going to set. And it is, and there's not really a trend per se, but it's just trying to be more uniform and more consistent in the type of hides you're going to see at an NACSW trial. And AKC um, also, they're also trying to help with that consistency as well, so that you're not having. Um, you know, uh, the differences in the hides be so vastly different when, from trial to trial. They want the hides to be pretty consistent from trial to trial and level to level. So that's, um, and then it, it changes because the hides that we used to have, and I know Christy's been around from the beginning, the hides that we used to have for level one are like level three or le elite hides now, <laughs> right? They're, they're a little different. Um, so yeah, it's not a, a particular... Uh, trend is just they're trying to be more consistent and trying to with more people doing it as you get bigger um, you there's got to be some kind of consistency to uh, the high placement and all that stuff right um let's see there's been a lot of lots of there's another question I think I missed uh, oh. there was one about fearful dogs but um I'm gonna go with this one while you look that one up. Is high placement more difficult in NACSW or AKC? I only set AKC, I do not set NACSW, but in you, if you mean in terms of running it, it's gonna vary from trial to trial and level to level. I think when I set master hides in AKC, I feel empowered or allowed to set some fairly aggressive stuff because if a team fails, they're failing this one search. Where I think in NACSW, there has to be more consideration towards trying to set things that are attainable, where maybe in AKC that doesn't exist. I know when I set AKC novice hides, I'm trying to set hides that the vast majority of the competitors are gonna pass if they have prepared, 
-hmm. So variety from level to level when you compare the two venues is going to to really have a lot of variety in it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Paula Powers had a question. Um, uh, how to keep her fearful dog prepared for something she, he is, how do, how do I keep my fearful dog prepared for something I am not sure he's going to be scared of? He's doing very well in the sport, but we struggle with an unknown, with the unknown of what he can be scared of. I try everything at home and other places, but it's always something he has to overcome at a trial. I just don't want him to quit because he's afraid of something that's come up. Um, so, so to kind of wrap that up is for some of the feel for feel fearful dogs, what are some of the recommendations you might have in training uh, or to get them prepped for, for trialing um, that you might consider? One of the neatest things that was suggested to me when I was doing obedience with my whippets was that I take a 30 day challenge where for 30 days, I go to 30 different places and train for three minutes. And it didn't have to be the sport, it just had to be for 30 days, you go somewhere and do something for three minutes. And I think that that was really powerful for my dog's experience because the consistency of seeing something new every day and knowing that it was going to just last for a few minutes and then it was gonna be over, taught them that they were gonna be okay. It was one of the coolest things I've done in terms of training. I would drive somewhere and it might be someplace as close as the other side of the block or across the street or the park just down the way. It wasn't any place complicated. One day the Dairy Queen parking lot, the next day Walmart parking lot, uh, you know, just for 30 days, three minutes, somewhere new. It really changed everything. And I'm not suggesting you go there and set hides. I'm suggesting you go there and walk for three minutes, get in the car and go. Don't go and set heights. Just go and show your dog that this new place, you're not going to have to stay real long and you're going to be okay. And just getting that acclimation taken care of away from the sport and really submer you know, getting submerged in trying to take on this acclimation piece, really powerful. Don't do anything scary. Just go. I've been asked what I would do if my dogs were scared in a search environment in competition. And I've been fortunate in that I don't have that yet, but it's my belief that if I had a fearful dog in competition, I would remove them. I think of our competition time as being such a small part of what we do with our dogs that we have to protect it because it's really hard to fix something you broke in competition in training. So yeah. no matter what, protect your competition experience so if you end up with fear in competition, just show your dog that your dog can leave and then go work on that in acclimation away from the game. I know that's not a perfect answer and it's not and it's not necessarily as satisfying or as straightforward as people would like it to be, but I do think it takes you a long ways into understanding what your dog can do and growing what your dog can do in new environments. Yeah. I agree with that. We have a tendency of wanting that ribbon so bad sometimes we we overwhelm a worried dog or we we don't listen to what the dog's trying to tell us and the truth is um, i'm going to be honest in some cases there are some dogs that just competition maybe isn't something that they can really do depending on how 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 fearful they really are and how much they um um and you know how how deep the problem is, right? Uh, and there's some people that shouldn't that competition isn't a good fit for too. The difference is is these people that aren't a good fit don't come, but people that have a dog that don't that doesn't necessarily fit will still sometimes bring that dog. So give the dog the same break because there's people that aren't wired for it too, and we accept that. So we should accept that for the dogs too. Right. There are there are people that. Um, have really have difficulty trying to get through it, and um, and they 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 have a fit and they have a uh, they can have a meltdown when they don't win or they when the dog doesn't do something very well. And I think you really have to check yourself when you when you have that deep or that strong of a, of a reaction when you don't when you miss it, right? Because it's like right. why 
Why are we so upset about it? It's like the dog made a mistake or we had a bad day. Oh, well, go on and keep on doing it, you know, until the next time. Um, Cause it's a sport. I always call it like bowling. <laughs> it's a bowling <laughs> league. Sometimes you're going to bowl really great. And sometimes you're not. It's just right. the way it that's part of the, part of our, uh, part of what we enjoy and what we do with our, um, with our dogs. So yeah, I, it's one of those things that I, uh, um, to be very honest with folks about their dog and maybe what they can and cannot do and also set up their expectation. Then you might get there, but it might take you a little while to get there. Right. And if, and if they're okay with that and, and they're okay with giving the dog what they need to be able to be success, successful, then great. Um, so it's a, it gets to, it's, it's a very, very challenging situation when you do, when you have a feel fearful dog. I have, uh, in Novrick, I have not, um, had my dogs aren't really worried about much, but I'm very lucky that way. But, uh, that, uh, that's a great suggestion though, the 30 days in different places. Cause we always try to encourage people to go to different places, but this is kind of a nice finite quarter, 30 days, different places, do different things. That's a, that's really a, a really good, good tip though. Great. <laughs> uh, Anybody else have any questions? I love. So Aaron had, um, I love this one. Even though you aren't supposed to give training advice at NACSW or after an AKC search, don't you wish you could? <laughs> no. No, I don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> Did I say that clearly enough? <laughs> I, I I don't like it because I have such a small piece of information to go on. I might be saying something so painfully stupid that I would prefer to say nothing at all unless I have more information. <laughs> Handling advice, sometimes it's hard not to. Training advice, a little easier to stay quiet. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, and um, it, it just becomes, um, yeah, I would agree with that. Sometimes maybe it's just better to, that's good. And move yeah. on. I and, try. And, if, well, and the thing is, if they ask you, you can maybe su make suggestions off, you know, after the trial, but most people don't want to, you know, if they would really want to know, they would ask if they need, if they really want it. But yeah, but sometimes, yeah, it's better to just. <laughs> well, and, so, and in the moment, none of us want that information. Right? In the moment, none of us want that information. <laughs> well, Margaret is actually asking, can a handler ask for training thoughts at the end of a search? Not at the end of a search. At the no. end of the day, uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, depending, at the end of the day, I, I might talk to someone at the end of the day. But at the end of the search, it's really not fair to the day. You know, the, everybody that's trying to get through the day and the clock we're trying to run and the schedule, it's really not fair to have that moment at the end of the day. And it's really not, the judges really don't have enough information to really do that. Um, sorry, Angie was asking, um, can you elaborate on different style of hides between NACSW and AKC that you had mentioned earlier? Uh, different style of hides or yeah. Or I, they're a different strength, but man, there's a ton of variety in how CO set and how judges set. I don't think you can make a trend between the two venues as much for hide placement, just hide strength. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that? Because you um, host and you judge and you CO. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would probably say that. Um, uh, yeah, it's 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 very very different uh, because of the the search environment. I think somebody mentioned earlier about uh, the training facility and some of those challenges. Yeah, and it depends on what, the, it, you know, like at our training facility, when we have trials, we really scrub down the place and all that, and we're very mindful of that. But every place doesn't doesn't do that, and that's not good or bad. It's just different. And then, but some of the, the, the hides, like Holly mentioned earlier, it's a smaller room. So you have to be real thoughtful when you put a hide in a small room versus a, a much larger room with a lot more complexity in it. Um, so like you said, it's not really a, a, bl a black and white kind of decision. It's it's what you have in front of you, what kind of a situation you have in front of you and what kind of a room, what kind of environment that you can then make decisions on those, you know, those hides. And you have to know what the odor is gonna do so that you can make the best choices possible for the best outcome of the day. 
right? And I think somebody, Terry Lucas said that they've met some people that only travel on NACSW and look down on people and try other venues. Um, and yeah, I, I would have to agree some people that only do NACSW, um, it's because that's what they started in and it's not a backwards, it's different. It's an addition to, I, I really do agree that it's an addition to. Because you're gonna have different type of searches, different kinds of environments. You really, I think it gives your dog such well-roundedness in that ability to do those different uh, to do different venues. I'm a big proponent of doing um, the venues that you can. I realize there's only so much money, so you can only do so much. But I, um, I train, I, I compete with my dogs in all the venues. I really enjoy them all, um, and um, and 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 just brings a different experience and different. Ability, a different search for the dog for that day. So it, I, it's it's sad that there's people like that, but you know that's the dog sports people. That's sometimes that's the way it goes. It shouldn't be that way because it's not a step back. It's different. So well, and in the end, the only opinion that matters on that is your own. That's so true. just don't adopt someone else's attitude to replace your own. Go do you. Right, and if you ask that dog, they have no idea if they're, what venue they're competing in. They're there to find odor. So. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, the dog doesn't care. They have, they're having a great time with, uh, with uh, whatever they're doing. Um, any other questions that you? Um, any other questions? I, I know you guys had a lot of questions about different things, but um, so the, I have the question to kind of take us home here. What are some of the things people can do that they can maybe incorporate? at a trial so they can have a better outcome for that day? Well, we talked about the list of objectives that aren't attached to outcome. I think that's excellent. Other things I think are really good. If you can get together and do fun matches, you can get together with your friends and run timers and video cameras on each other. You can get a little bit competitive in your play and in practice. You can rehearse some of that to some degree that it makes it just a little bit easier. Holding on to perspective is probably everything, but anything we can do to increase some of the drama and some of the pressure in training will also help bridge that difference and help us do a better job when we finally get there and it really counts. How often do we really put out the start line? How often do we have someone standing there with a stopwatch? How often do we have someone videotaping and say, as soon as you call finish, you have to watch this. There's lots of things we can do to up the pressure in training that'll help us prepare for the comp feeling of competition. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, yeah, that's really great. Cause it's like, there's things you can do to just, and just really, and I know it's hard to say, oh, just go have fun or enjoy the journey. Some people that makes them a little crazy, uh, <laughs> but, if they could do that, they would. <laughs> uh, but it really is about that. Um, so somebody mentioned, uh, do you have a favorite trial experience at a trial in either venue that you've, a, a favorite trial memory, I guess they're asking. Oh, I've got to say that baking to death in sandwich for you for the first trial has to be one of my all time favorites. In yeah. fact, on my way, on my way home from that trial, I picked up an acorn and planted it and grew a little tree that I still have just to remember how much fun it was to get started in the journey. So that one, that one's a favorite. I also was invited to judge the first weekend that AKC had trials for Fargo and I was judging amongst friends. And oh, that wow. was just wonderfully fun when none of us knew really how this worked and no one had done it yet. And to be surrounded by great people and friends there was just absolutely wonderful. I have so many great memories doing it, but those are the two that jump out the loudest just when I think about some of the great times I've had. Yeah. And one of the things that I have to say is, like, I'm missing all my students now. I'm missing them every week. I'm missing the dogs. And, yeah, I'm kind of missing trialing, too, that whole environment. Because for me... One of the, I am an extrovert, so this whole isolation thing was kind of yeah. <laughs> natural fun for me because um, I, I miss, I love people and I want to be with people, 
but I really do uh, have to say that enjoying the people and that connection with folks at at trials and at the, as a competitor and as a CEO and as a and as a um, I'm, I'm not a judge for AKC, but a judge for some of the uh, smaller venues. I really enjoy that that piece of it. That's that's so much fun. Um, the whole people connection thing was just, which is a thing for me. <laughs> I have to have that. Sure. And that's why I, when I trial, a lot of people are like, oh, you can sit in the car and not talk to anybody. I cannot do that. That's not, that would not be fun for me. Well, you're the tailgate queen. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Yes. I am. And, uh, and I really love, um, and that's why I love to go. I, I see, oh, now for people that I love and, Hosts that I love and people that I enjoy being with, so it makes it so much fun uh, to be in that. And like you said, the group of people that's so that's so fun. And then we love having you a, a judge for us. And you were in my, uh, you've actually judged me and my dogs quite a few times, so it's been mm -hmm. it's been pretty fun. And then it's also um, it's nice when you have a very kind judge. And I have to say, most of the NACSW judges are pretty nice for the most mm -hmm. part. They're super nice and super supportive, and they they really do want you to win and do well and have a great day so yeah yeah it's fun um i go to the line with the thought that doug will have a a here's a bonus for me yeah well um holly thank you so much for being with us today we had such a good talk i knew this would be great uh lots of questions and lots of great people um as we talked i'd like to have more people on with different thoughts and opinions and things to, to kind of talk about and really get us thinking about things. So thank you for, for letting us put you on the spot here for an hour and talk about different things. It was really great fun. Thank you. It was great to see both of you. I've missed you. So this was a, a super way to spend an evening. Really appreciate being able to be here. All right. Good to see you too. Thank you. You too. All right. Hold on one second. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs>